in there, but come October the 7th last year, mate, uh, our lives changed and you now are uh, in a great position. You can go and watch the games, cover on it for BBC Radio Newcastle. You're working at the Pink Palace in uh, in Newcastle as well and talking about it, talking to fans. It's, uh, it must be great. Yeah, look at in the last 12 months, it's amazing. The That's things have changed. Um, it's... It's a little bit awkward, really, because when Ashley was here, it was great because you could have a moan and groan and give out. And, and now you can fuck all the give out of it. It's just not, just not the same. No, I'm kidding. It's uh, the, 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 the transformation in the last 12 months has been, has been phenomenal. Um, you, Used to get up on a on a Saturday morning and games and all. Here we go. Got to go again. It's going to be the same old, same old. Um, defend deep, try and break. If we can get something all well and good. Um, and it, it was just depressing. And it was depressing going to St James's and seeing people who were depressed probably more than you were. Um, no smiling faces. Everybody down just going for the sake of going and now it's amazing what what the takeover has done all of a sudden people enjoying going to football matches um, enjoying a, watching a side that's trying to win games that's pressing high up the pitch that's trying to win the ball back in the opposition's final tour of the pitch instead of trying to win it back in your own tour of the pitch um, yeah it's been, it, it's been phenomenal and just the fact that the side now is trying to win the games and it's just brought a, a smile to everybody's faces and I think some people are a little bit disappointed because we haven't spent more money and because we're the richest club in the world but I said at the time that it was always going to be a marathon for me it was never going to be a, it was never going to be a sprint it was never going to be something that was just going to happen overnight it was going to be a gradual process and I think I think the people who are in charge now have got to, got to give them an awful lot of credit for the way they've gone about it and the players that they've brought in. You know, players that they've obviously done the homework on because all of them have come in and did the ground running. They, they haven't needed any settling in period. Um, Botman's come in, he looks... Botman's a strange one for me because I came away from the game at the weekend and it's happened a couple of times with him where you'd never really mentioned them during commentary and you come away from the game and you go he played really well today you know he's one of those who always seems to be in the right place at the right time makes the right decision makes the right pass but you don't really notice him because it's got to the stage now where you just think oh he's, he's always going to be there he's always going to do that um, Bruno's come in and he's been he's been a revelation, you know. Um, for for a guy who came in as a holding midfield player to, to to have scored the goals that he scored, and he, he looks he looks a better player in those advanced areas when you play him further up the pitch because he plays in pockets and he finds pockets of space, uh, and he's always got time, and he's just he's just a top top player. Um, Isaac. The two goals he got at, at, at Liverpool, you know, were the second one for me was even better because he stuck two Liverpool um, defenders on the backsides and then stuck it in the net. Uh, to shame he got injured when he, when he did. Um, Dan Bourne's come in, been been solid. Um, I don't see Dan Bourne as an out and out left back going forward. If I'm perfectly honest, I think he's he's an out and out centre back. He's a big lad. Uh, who heads it, tackles, passes it nice and simple. But, uh, because for me in the modern game now, your full backs are always your outlet. They're the ones who get you up the pitch. Um, and you need somebody who's going to be able to play in those advanced areas and pitches. And nothing against the lad, because as I said, I think he's done absolutely tremendous since coming in here. Um, I don't see him doing that. Target, do well. Um, steady know. Eddie, Eddie. Yeah, yeah, but you look at it and you wonder if he really fancies him, you know, because all of a sudden he's putting Dan Bourne in there ahead of him, and, um, and the 
boy on the other side is just just not great. He's up there with Warren Barton and John Anderson. <laughs> yeah, I wish. I wish. Um, don't put me in the same category as fucking Barton. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of you on next thing. Um, but no, Trippy is just. I love Trippy. Um, and the reason I love him is because he makes all the right decisions and everything's simple. And that's what makes, you know, people go on about great players. And the thing that makes great players is they do the simple things really well, but then they've got that little bit of sprinkling on top. But they always make the right choices. And this boy always makes the right choices. He's just, he's just a top, top player. So, you know, I think the owners have got to take an awful lot of um, adulation for that, for the players that they brought in. Um, you know, I know a lot of people would want to see superstars coming in, but the players they brought in seem to have a bond as well. They seem to have a togetherness. They're all in it together. And I think you've got to, you've got to do your homework on players now. Are they the right character? Are they, are they the right sort? Will they fit into this group? Will they blend in? Will they rock the boat? If they rock the boat, mm, you don't really want them. So, so I think they they deserve an awful lot of credit. Uh, it's been a it's been a quick twelve months for me. It's been a really enjoyable twelve months. Looking forward to going to Old Trafford at at the weekend. Um, you know, I think what we've only won once down there since nineteen seventy two. Um, but I think we've got. A, Big, big chance to add to that come the weekend, and uh, I know you get you, you get a little bit carried away. We all do, you know. We should have beaten Bournemouth. We didn't. They came and had two blocks of four, and we didn't. We didn't have enough guile to break them down. Brentford came and had a goal, and couldn't defend to save their lives. You know, the, 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 the defending was absolutely awful. But um, yeah. Looking forward to the weekend and looking forward to January as well to see if we are still in and around that area. How what did they do? You know, did they look at it and think, oh, we've got a real chance here if we if we spend a few bob? I, and I don't think they'll go overboard. I don't. I think they've been really shrewd and as I say, in what they've done. Um, and if need be, they. I think they will spend again, but I don't think they'll, they'll spend millions and millions. I think they could be shrewd acquisitions again. Yeah, I agree. I think they'll do a, a steady... A step, like a, a, I still think it could be a marquee signing in January, but then they'll go for bust again in, in the summer, but shrewd signings. I think, I think you're right. I think, looking at um, anniversaries, we're coming up to Eddie Howe's first year in charge. He wasn't... The number one choice by supporters, it has to be said. I mean, you know, the names which always get bandied around with a club like ours, you know, your Pochettino, your Mourinho, your Rafa Benitez might come back. All of those names were getting mentioned at the time. Eddie Howe, though, he was on the radar and by all accounts came to speak to the owners, uh, put his CV in front of them, and they were very impressed with him at the interview. And so far, so good, John. <laughs> you, you can't help but be impressed with what he's done. Um, to come into the football club in the state that it was in um, and the position that we were in and to have turned it around the way that he has, you know, you, you can't give the guy enough credit. Um, you know, I agree, I think there's, there was a lot of supporters that raised eyebrows when he got the job, um, but he's done, he's done a phenomenal job. You know, he's, he wants to play with high intensity. They, they obviously train at high intensity as well because there's one or two picking up soft muscle injuries. Um, but that's, that's to be expected. Um, but he's been, he's been brilliant. He's been brilliant. You know, it's the job that he did the back end of last season to get us into the position that we finished was, was miraculous. You know, I don't think, I don't think he, you could have picked any other managers out and said, go on, can you do that? And I think, you, you know, some of the names that you mentioned there would have struggled to have done what he did to get us into the position that he's, he's got us into. Um, I think before going to Fulham a couple of weeks ago, I think he was starting to feel the pressure a little bit as well, because we'd only won one, 
okay, we'd only lost one, but then then the, there the stats aren't it? it can be anything you want them to be. You look at it, well, we've only lost one, so yeah, but we've only won one. Oh yeah, we've only lost. So and I think he that win, I think it galvanised everybody as well. You know, I think it was a it was a great performance. Could have won it by more. Uh, had two disallowed. Had numerous other chances. Um, and obviously scoring five then at the weekend. Uh, you know, uh, but Saturday will be good test or Sunday will be a good test. You know that. Uh, this is, I suppose, the real big test for us going away. I don't think these are great. I think they're on the dark downward spiral in Manchester United. Um, but it's uh, it's still a good test, you know, because our record there hasn't been great. But you can't you can't give the guy enough credit, you know, because of of what he's doing. But he knows, you know, he knows that with the owners that we've got now that. He's only three, four defeats away from you know it all going pear shaped again. So it, I think there's always pressure on him because he, and he knows he needs to keep getting results and he needs to keep grinding it out. But up to now, you can't help but be well impressed with what he's done. You've waxed a little about the players that have come in. Mm. Um, behind the scenes, though, there's been some big appointments too. We've had Dan Ashworth mm. come in. Uh, Darren Eels, of course, who was on BBC Radio Newcastle, um, giving his first interview last night. Uh, we're now bringing in um, Silverstone from uh, who had a good time behind the scenes at Arsenal, commercial manager. Um, you know, and again, the skeleton staff that Ashley left is now being you know given a new injection. And um, we've had, we've heard from them all, and we've also heard from our chairman. Okay, it was an email um, that went out to season ticket holders, which was put out into the public eye. But you know, the chairman. Our Ryan has come out and spoken as well. So we've had a charm offensive, we've had a, a lot of PR. What have you made of all of that? The appointments and what they've had to say? Um, I, look, I, I think they were appointments that needed to be made because of, of the state that the club was in. You know, there was nobody overseeing anything. Um, they needed to get people in place. They needed to get people with experience and good people in to, because of the state that the football club was in, there was no infrastructure within the club. You know, there was so much wrong, there was so much that needed to be put right. Um, it was basically building from the ground upwards. It was ba basically starting all over again, Steve. You know, so they brought uh, Ashworth in, who was at West Brom, did a great job at Brighton. Um, Darren Neal has come in, he was at West Brom with, with Ashworth as well. Um, was lucky enough to meet him at Wolves, stayed in the same hotel as us when we were down there and had a couple of hours with him and he was yeah, he was he was very, very interesting, you know, um great background. Um he was a young boy at, at Cambridge, got let go, went on a scholarship to America, um, did a law degree, you know, he's 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 a real shrewd boy, um, very, very clever man, um, and built Atlanta from nothing, you know. Um, they, they've no stadium, they've no players, they've no training facilities, they had nothing, and he went out there and he, he was the main man, he was the one who did it all. Um, and he says he's going to communicate, um, and I believe him, you know, I think he's, he's, he speaks really, really well. Um, Met Ash, Dan Ashwood a couple of times. Quite a, doesn't say a great deal, um, but you know these are these are the right people that you want in. Um, these are the people that you want running your football club. So, and I think the thing about it as well is it's it's all right bringing these people in, but they've all got to interact and they've all got to work together. And the right talk to Darren Eels, the relationship between Ashwood and himself who. Obviously, both together at West Brom, and Eddie Howe seems good. You know, you need a manager who's on the same level and same line as these guys, and, and that seems to be the case at this moment in time. So, look at it; it's all looking good, um, and hopefully, it, it's onwards and upwards. You know, I don't think I don't think anybody can have any complaints. Yes, there, there'll be a few who are a little bit restless and thinks that more should have been done, and we should be doing a lot more, but as I said earlier, I think it's a marathon, not a sprint, and there's no doubt we'll get there, um, 
it might take a little bit of time, but we most definitely will get there. Question the, the audience. Obviously, there's a big, a lot of talk at the moment about uh, the stadium being renamed. Now, we all know our previous owner, Mike Ashley, uh, the dead of night, got somebody to crowbar St. James's Park off and call it the Sports Direct Arena, and then annoyed a lot of fans, and annoyed everybody when their protests followed, and the rest is history. But just to show our hands, how many people would be happy if uh, the new owners got a financial deal and um, a lot of money came in and it was injected into the team and they called it, let's say, the Time Mouse Surf Cafe <laughs> at St James's Park. Would you be happy? Show your hands. I think, okay, it's interesting, John. No, yeah, it's not 100%. No, no, no but I, th I think you've got to be. I think if it's bringing finance into the, in, into the football club, and what we've got to remember as well is that football's moved on. You know, football's moved on. And it's all about finance. It's all about getting financing. And it, it's all about money. And you look at the teams, not just in this country, but all over Europe, the most successful teams, they've all got one, th one thing in common. They've all got loads of money. Yeah. And they can get the be best players. Now, in order to do that, you need to do things like this. You need sponsorship um, deals like this. And you can, you can call it what you like. But to a lot of old timers, it'll always be St. James's Park. You know, you can call it blah, blah, this is blah. But everybody who's going to the game will still say, go to St. James's. It doesn't matter what, what's on it, it's, it will always be St. James's. Um, I mean, a lot of the younger, younger supporters will buy into it a, a bit more, I suppose. But for the, for the older generation, I think it will always be St. James's. It's going to be an issue though because they've already put out a statement yeah. saying that they're going to speak to supporters. Well, first of all, um, uh, you know, a lot of our crowd seem to, all, you know, some people like to twist on 21, and I've seen it on social media. People are already twisting about it. Oh, but which fans are going up to talk about but, it? I'm not bothered. All I want to see is Newcastle, you know, compete, but have a bit of hope and win a trophy. I'm but not then really if, if, if you've got to make sacrifices to win trophies and, win, and get players, that's what you've got to do. You know, it, it's it, it's part and parcel of the game now. You know, it's if you if somebody gives says to you, if somebody comes along and says, "Oh, we'll give you fifteen million pounds to call the stadium X Y Z, whatever," you can't turn that type of money down. Or as you said, X Y Z at St James's Park or whatever, but it'll still be St James's. Yeah. You know that that name will be there, but it, it, it will it, it will still. I'm old fashioned and call it what you like, but I always call it St. James's Park. Me too. You yeah. know, so, and I think a lot of people in here probably do the same. Okay, so, I'll go on, I'll come to you up. Why would you need to do that when we're richest club in the world? Because you, because you need to bring finances in. You know, just because we've got the most money, we just can't just go and spend it all. You, know, you, need, to you, need, to, yeah, you need to generate your own input. You need to generate these um, these sponsorship deals. That's what Man I mean. Manchester City got away with it they, by they got oh millions for naming their the training ground. I forget what they named it, but they got absolute fortunes for it. Um, now they're cutting down. They're, they're looking at all these sponsorship deals, but because we're the richest club in the world, doesn't mean that we can just go boom. There you are. We're going to spend that much money. We've already spent two hundred million, and. You know, the, Darren Neils was saying last night that it's going to be very, very difficult to keep spending 200 million all the time. You know, we're going to have to cut our cloth accordingly and we're going to have to start generating our own money. And listening to him, he, he seemed to have got the indication that there was, there was deals there that are contractual, that they're trying to get out of to get new deals in. So it's you know, everything's up in the air and it's, Actually, it's hard to roll. Oh, well, did you expect anything else? No, definitely well, not. Definitely well, not. You had a question, man. about doing it the right way. Doing it the right way. Yeah, well, I mean, this is what he said. He said he's going to get out and he's going to speak to supporters and supporters groups and, um, you know, um, and I, as I said, I think he, he comes across as a genuine sort of bloke, and I, 
if he says that's what he's going to do, I, I, I believe that that's what he will do. Um, you know, but again, we've got to be realistic and saying, well, if, if, we, if we've got to do these deals, we've got to do these deals. You know, if you've got to, if you've got to generate income and you've got to bring that sort of income in, and by renaming St James's is one way of doing it. By renaming, by naming the, the training ground, you know, to get it. A huge sponsorship deal for that. That again, that's more income for um, for the club. Look at the sleeve deal they got. You know the sleeve deal. They, they got more for the sleeve deal yeah. than they did this. You know the shirt sponsorship. Yeah, yeah I, I think the the short sponsorship one will be an interesting one as well. Um, you know the the money that could be made from that. I mean, they look as if they've got a lot of people lined up, but because of the deals that are already there, it could take a little bit longer to get the, these deals in place. And I suppose they could pay some of them off, and some of them might not want to go because of the, the being associated with the richest club in the world. It, you know, they want to stay. I'm going to ask you another football-related question, and then I'm going to open it up to, to people if you want to ask some questions. And it's the one that's been doing the rounds, and I know you spoke about it on Total Sport as well. Two left-footed centre-halves. Have you got anything wrong with two left footers playing together? Yeah. What's the problem with that? Not so much about them in possession of the ball. It's whoever's playing on the right side, whoever starts attacking you on that right side, and you've got to tackle with your own foot. I think it, it, it's easier for right footed players to play on that left side because you'll always see right footed players will use their left foot. They might not be very good with it, but they will use it. How many times do you see left-footed players who predominantly always use their left foot? I mean, prime example, played with Liam Brady, absolutely phenomenal football player. Only stood on his right foot. Only stood on it. Would, couldn't use his right foot. All left-sided, but brilliant. Kevin Sheedy. No right foot whatsoever. Couldn't tackle with his right foot. Couldn't fucking tackle with his left foot either. <laughs> but, but he, you know, so I've got a, I do have a problem. And not so much when they're in possession of the ball, is when teams start to get at you and you get sideways on in an unfamiliar position where with that way we get left foot all the time. And if you're predominantly at left side, it's a lot, not a lot easier. Yeah. Where if you're this way and you're trying to tackle that way, mm -hmm. yeah. no. And I, I, I would worry about it. I would, um, but that's just me. So, not, next, so the next question is: Botman or Burn for you, then? Botman. Do you not think Botman's probably close to being two-footed? Mm, he's yet to show me that. I know people say he is, but I've yet to see him use his right foot. I've seen him use his left foot. Um, I've seen Dan Bourne use his left foot. Um, I think, I think it's a it's a predicament for the manager. I think he's got to he's got to decide who his number one pair in is. At this moment in time, it looks like it's Cher and Botman, um, and he obviously likes Dan Bourne because. He's put down Bourne in at left back. <clears throat> and as I said to you earlier on, I don't see Dan Bourne as a long term left back. I think he's been, he's been done absolutely great since he's since he's come in. You know, he's he's been phenomenal um, when he's played at centre back and he's done okay at left back. Um, but I think somewhere down the line they've got to decide I think during the summer, they'll bring in another right side at Santa Fe. And that's just. Mind you, they're bringing a centre forward and a central midfield player as well. <laughs> it is like dream team football, isn't it? Okay, enough of me. Uh, if you've got some questions now, is your chance. You had a question earlier on, so go on, ask it. John, two parts of the question, if you don't mind. If the angle injury that you picked up, if you were still playing today and you picked that angle injury up today, would you still be playing? Could you still be playing? And the second part of my question is, uh, how long did it take you to get over to your injury? Or are you, in fact, over, uh, it, are you over it? <laughs> well, what, what happened?
happened with the injury was it was the end of, and it happened at the end of the season. We played um, a testimonial game for Len White at Whitley Bay, and the pitch was an absolute disgrace. And we were going, Ireland were going to their first ever major tournament, the European Championships in Germany. And uh, Willie says, "Look, just play 45 minutes." And, and I went, "Yeah, right." But the pitch was shocking, and there was nobody near us. And right on half time, I just uh, pothole just went over um, ligaments. Went the went the hospital. Derek Wright, um, who's just retired from St James's, was unbelievable physio. Came with us. Um, the X-ray. They, they went the x-ray and they said no point in x-ray and there's, there's too much swelling and then we put it in a pot for six weeks and I went you can't put it in a pot for six weeks I got to Germany in three so they said well it's in plaster for six weeks so I went oh, really okay so after 14 days um, I got a hacksaw and I cut the plaster off and uh, <laughs> I went to Dublin and seen Jack and Jack went, and these were Jack's exact words. He went, what the fuck are you doing here? He says, I was told you're a knacker. And I went, no, no, I'm fine. And he went, what do you mean you're fine? He went, give us a look at your ankle. And I showed him the ankle and he went, he said, you're fucking joking. He says, you're not going anywhere with that. And I went, look, I'm fine. And he went, right. He says, I'll tell you what we're going to do. He says, we're going to have going to go and train tomorrow, you've got to train. So I went and trained and I padded it all up and I had to wear uh, a boot that was two sizes too big. And uh, got through it and I was in agony. And before he named his final squad, he said, right, we'll give you a fitness test. If you come through this fitness test, you go, if you don't, you're not going. I went, right, fine. And I was desperate to go because it was the first time we'd ever made a major tournament and you wanted to be a part of it. So I went and I did this fitness test and I'd never been in as much pain. And I got through it and he went, right, you go. So got to Germany um, and I was training and I was overcompensating and I did me back. And when we got back, from uh, European Championships. Jack sent a letter to all the managers, and Willie was manager at the time, and I got fined by the club for cutting. The club didn't even know it gone. This, so I got fined by the club. But uh, Jack had sent a letter to Willie saying, uh, thanks very much for releasing your players as usual. And at the end of it, he went, P.S. And I've had a great fucking holiday. <laughs> 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 Great question. Never heard that one. Before. Oh, and the other one, yeah. If yeah. if it had been done now, yeah, it would, wouldn't have been a problem. Wouldn't have been a problem. No, no, wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been a problem. But I had five hops on it. Eventually, they said, look, if you, you keep playing, you're gonna end up where you won't be able to walk. And how long did it take you to get your head around the fact that you wouldn't be playing again? Well, that was '88, and I finished in '92, um, and between. Between 89 and 92, I didn't play. I was in and out, I didn't train. Play, it was playing games, missing training, and missing games, and it was just, I was never never fit, basically. So, people would say I wasn't fit for 10 years, but there you go. <laughs> Anybody else got a question? Yes, Donald. What did the, because of the public violence, 88, yeah. What did Jack Charlton bring that party? What did Jack Charlton bring to Ireland? Uh, Check. Check boo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, uh, he, he was lucky in a way, you know, because of the quality of players that he had. Um, now, you can go and say he did a phenomenal job, which he did. But the quality of players that he had in Ronnie Whelan, Aldridge, Houghton, Niall Quinn, um, you know, top players. Um, Paddy Bono was in goal, Mick McCarthy. 
Uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, but these players were there prior to Jack coming, and they they wanted to play like every other international football team, get it and play from the back, and all look good on the ball. And Jack came in, and he said, sat everybody down, and this was prior to the Wales game, his first game, and he went, look, he says, I'll come in here, he says, no you can all play. He says, but we're going to play it a certain way, and if you don't want to do it, say so now, and you can walk out that door, and there'll be no hard feelings. And, you know, Liam Brady wanted to come and get it off the back four, and play, and play little balls, and Jack went, don't want you doing that, I want you playing further up the pitch. And after a couple of games, Liam went, no, oh, this isn't for me, and Jack went, fine. Now Jack said, it took a little bit of time because Jack said, the thing about European football and international football is everybody thinks they're players. He says, if you watch international football, ball goes long, defenders saunter back and get it, and they'll come and they'll play it, and not, they don't get any pressure until they get about the halfway line. He says, we're going to change that. He said, we're going to go long in behind fullbacks. He said, and we're going to press. And as soon as they turn with the ball, they're going to see two or three green shorts. And he says, they'll shit themselves. And basically, that's... And, you know, everybody goes on about this pressing game now. Yeah. Basically, that's what Jack did. You know, Jack pressed high up the pitch. You get the ball back high up the pitch. Always... And the thing he's told defenders, fullbacks... Used to go light if fullbacks knocked it inside. Knock it down the line. Never put the ball in danger. You knock the ball in there, gets cut out all of a sudden, opposition's in on your goal. And when you think about it, it all makes common sense. It's basic common sense. But everybody wants to play. And like goalkeepers, Jack today would tear goalkeepers' heads off. That Brentford keeper would never, oh, he'd be, he'd be swinging off the time bridge. And the, the centre back, you get, oh, he'd, he'd be hanging there with him. But, you know, never put the ball in danger. If it's got to go, it's got to go. Because we, then, we can then recycle it, we get set up, we see it. Um, so he was a little bit ahead of his time in that way. But it took these players who were good players and playing at good sides, you know, they, they were all playing. Um, First division or Premier League football, uh, playing with your, your Arsenal's, your Liverpool's, uh, Manchester United's. It took them a little bit of, to buy into it. But then when they seen that it was successful and all of a sudden you were beating top European sides, they bought into it. You know what it is? He's spot on. Um, so, yeah, he was, again, I, I reiterate, everybody got, oh, this high pressing game. But Jack was doing that toward the year ago. Good question. Anybody else? Yes, me. John, there's uh, obviously a strong emphasis on character now, isn't it? Maybe in Faso, but in worse teams, about getting on with each other, getting on with managers, getting on with fans. How did you, in your era, bring everybody along to the same mentality? I think, I think the thing about it, Paddy, is it, it was a different era. You know, it's, it was, everybody was in it together. Um, and there was none of this, if you made a mistake, it was high fives. Like that, the centre back at the weekend gives it away, they score a goal, and they're all high fiving him. And I was going light, I'm going, you know, you just cost me two grand or whatever, and bonus money, and the high five, and going, well done, ah, oh, don't worry about it, it's fine. But, Back then, if you made a mistake, you got told about it. And you got to kick up the arse, you know, and people would fight you. And uh, it was a different culture, and then people had a different outlook. And, and you know, hear people say, oh, well, they should high five him because of his confidence is gone. You know, oh, 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 oh. so a mistake. You make a mistake at work. <coughs> You get told, don't you? You, keep, you make, make the same mistake again. You get a, a verbal warning and a written warning. You make it three times, you're out in your ear. These guys make it once, make it, oh, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it, it's fine. 
we'll just get relegated at the end of the season. It's really great, but don't worry about it. You keep making them mistakes, you keep giving those goals away. Well, it's all right. Um, and I think the mentality was different back then. You know, I really do. I think it was, you had to stand up and be counted. You, you couldn't be a shrinking violet. Um, because if you were a shrinking violet, and if people seen that in you as well, if people seen you were a little bit on the soft side, you didn't have to take advantage of it. Um, that's why people always took advantage of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Who was the most difficult opponent you ever played against? You, you sort of dreaded you most most difficult against you. And who was the opponent you loved to kick up a height? <laughs> All of them. That's easy. <laughs> I, I, I enjoy kicking anybody. I don't, I don't um, Mark Hughes was... Because the thing about Mark Hughes was he never moaned. Never moaned at referees, never moaned at you. And you always knew. When you, when you were roughing somebody up and they were moaning and giving out, you always knew you had the better of it. It was the ones who didn't say anything, because you always knew it was coming back somewhere along the line. And somewhere along the line, he'd, he'd do you kick up just when you weren't expecting it. Um, the best player I ever played against was Maradona. He was phenomenal. Um, he had such a low center of gravity, you just couldn't knock him over, you couldn't knock him off the ball. He was, he, he was a phenomenal player. Um, Gaza type, you know, Gaza is not much stockier than Gaza. Probably better balanced than Gaza as well because he just weebled, you know. Um, but there, there was another one, talking about right foots and left foots. Best player in the world, he couldn't kick with his right foot. <laughs> yeah, you know? but phenomenal player. Anybody else? Yes. I mean, I've never been this excited since obviously Keegan and Robson come, took over. But do you think Eddie Howe will make that extra level with, and win something? Oh, I thought you were that? saying because I was here. <laughs> 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 just holding the flame, doesn't it? Can Eddie Howe get the levels of Sir Bobby uh, and Keir Keir? Let's bring him in. But go anything. one. Joe Harvey uh, is the last man who won uh, a trophy. Do you think he get to that level and win a trophy without getting peddled? I think. Yeah, look at the levels that Kevin and Sir Bobby uh, got us to uh, were, you know, unreal, unreal. incredible to watch, uh, but never won it. Uh, you know, you want to win, you me. want to win trophies, uh, but that could have been uh, so near yet so far. Um, can Eddie, Eddie Howe do it? Um, I don't see why not, but he knows that he needs to keep winning football matches yeah. and, you know, um, and as I said earlier on, he knows that if he loses four or five games on the bounce, right. all of a sudden there's, there's a pressure on him, you know. Um, <laughs> you would hope that he would, I mean, what he's done so far, oh, only, you wouldn't, you wouldn't only, back against it. You know, he's, he's, the way he's, he's done it, um, just talking to Steve coming over in the car there, and I, I was saying, what he's done is, is, is been Unbelievable, but when you start getting these so-called big players, how will how will he cope with them? How how will he handle them? Will he be able to handle that those egos and and, and be able to sort it out? And, you know, so it's still it's still a long way to go. But you, you would hope, yeah. Look, what he's done has been incredible, and you'd love to see him get the benefits of that because of what he's done. You'd like to look to think that, look, even the League Cup, you know, got Palace in a couple of weeks, even winning that. Would be, that would be, be just, nice, just a start. But you've got to start somewhere, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, you've got to start somewhere. But the thing about football is you never know that. Uh, you never know what's around the corner. It can all be gone so swimmingly, but it can quickly, quickly change. Um, so, <coughs> We'll have to wait to see. Uh, yeah. Last couple of questions. Yes. What do you think of Lascelles as a player? And do you think he should still be the club captain? What do you think of Lascelles? Should he still be the club captain? Um, I think. 
I think when somebody needed to stand up and say things, I think you've got to give the boy an awful lot of credit for, for what he did. You know, he stood up and as as a young player um, and said it as it was and, and called players out. Um, but I think if you're going to move on, you know, you, you thank him very much for what he's done. You've been a good skipper. Um, you've been good off the pitch as well. Um, but where we're going, like, you're not at the level that we, we're we going to need. Um, and sometimes big decisions need to be made. And I always think back to, to Kevin when David Kelly scored all them goals that season. And then he ran David and said, listen, thanks very much. And supporters rode up in their arms because they thought, oh, but you can't have any niceness about it. You know, sometimes you've got to be, you've got to be cynical and say, yeah, you did great for us there. In that division, you did great, but where we want to go, I don't think you're going to be there to take us to that next level. I don't think you're good enough to take us to that next level. Um, and I think that's where it is with, with, with Lascelles. And I think, I think he probably knows that as well. You know, I think he knows that Bourne's ahead of him, Bachman's ahead of him, Scher's ahead of him. You know, he's, he's forward and lying now. Will he play too much football? Probably not. Um, but look at what he did was was great. You know, as I say, I think he he'll always be held in, in high admiration for for what he did in standing up and, and calling senior players out and telling them how it was. Um, but I don't think there can be any sentiment in it now. You know, I think if you if you want to move forward, tough tough decisions need to be made. Yeah, I agree. Last question from the floor. Anybody? I yes. think uh, teams from the, the 80s would manage in the Premier League now. I don't think there'd be too many of them left after 90 minutes. Uh, I think uh, I think the games moved on from the 80s. Do I think it's better in certain aspects? Uh, I do, but again, call me old-fashioned, but I think the art of defending and the art of tackling has been taken out of the game. You know, for the life of me, I, I can never I can never get my head around if you tackle somebody, how are you expected not to make contact with them? You know, it, it's, it's an impossibility. If I go for a 50-50 ball with you and the ball flies up in the air, we're going to make contact. I seen a game the other, other day, uh, Division 1 or Division 2 game, but two boys went into the same ball and they both slid and the ball flew up in the air and they rolled around and the referee sent both of them off. <laughs> it was the Division 1 game, it was just for the weekend. And I'm going, you know, I can understand um, late challenges and uh, everything else, but I still can't get away when somebody makes a legitimate attempt to win the ball and they're slightly late and all of a sudden it's a red card and you think, mm, was, there, was there intent in it? Probably not, but because of the way the rules have gone, they've got to go. Um, but it's, look, it, it's, it, it's great for forward players, you know, um, it's, uh, but I just think the art of, of defending is, is gone out of the game. Um, it, it's all about passing goalkeepers. I mean, prime example, goalkeepers don't have to be good at their hands now, they just have to be great with their feet. And as we've seen at the weekend, they're not very fucking good at that either. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. What would be deemed a successful season for Newcastle this year? <coughs> Top eight. Top eight. Top nine. Um, Couple of good cup runs. I think that would be deemed a success for me. I know other people probably would would want more, um, but as I said, I think it's a journey that you're on, and you've got to progress. So, top eight, top nine, decent cup runs, and then you progress again next year. Hopefully, get into a 
European spot next year. And with a little bit of luck, we could win a cup this year. You know, got a nice home draw against Palace uh, in the League Cup, and then see you get through that and see where you go. So, um, yeah, I would, I, I would say top eight and progress from there in a couple of good couple. Great stuff. Yeah, catch John. Oh, to, I, have, I have to tell you that. I meant, I meant to say this in the first half. Um, it was when Willie was manager, um, and I'd just come back from injury. Um, we played at Barnsley, and it was a wet, horrible Wednesday night. And uh, I wasn't having the best. Things weren't going right. And the dog ran on the pitch. And I jumped at the dog, and I missed the dog. And there was a wise, wise guy behind the dugout, and he went, fucking hell, Anderson. He said, you can't even catch the fucking dog. So with that, Colin Suggett comes running out and picks up the dog and he's walking off and the wise guy says, Suggett, why don't you leave the dog off and take Anderson off? <laughs> and Suggett so went, if the dog was fucking registered, I would. <laughs> That's a great place to finish. Yeah, you can catch John on BBC Radio Newcastle and Total Sport and you can also catch him pretty much at Pumphrey's in the big market with Gibbo every match day, but put your hands together, he's been a great guy tonight. John Anderson. Thank you. Anybody want to photograph or anything with John now?